so we are signing up with the community edition so there are uh, if you compare with the azure databrix so there are many features which are not present in the community edition but you can see that once we sign up with the azure databrix okay so once you open it here you get your home page databrix and here you have different workloads so depending upon your workload you can choose like but now most of our uh, like this tutorial will be based on the data science and engineering only uh, you can refer machine learning and you have the third workload that is your sql workload that is sql but that sql doesn't come with a community edition uh, you need to upgrade your databricks account maybe with the aws cloud or with the azure to get that sql but once we go with the azure databricks account then we will get those things okay so this is your home page and these are your workload options and at the home page you can see you can create a new notebook you can import the data from outside and you can have a quick start tutorial and if you want you can just have a quick look on what auto ml works on and some of the transformation data that is delta live tables so we need some time to come or to reach till here like what do you mean by delta live tables and you cannot perform the delta live tables in the community edition you need to either upgrade or you need to come to an azure database account okay so let us see all the options uh, in the community edition so first is create so you can create a new notebook you can create a table you can create a new cluster from here and the second option is your workspace so workspace is the space where you store all your all your folders and files or notebooks so if you click on the users you will see your personal email address and you can store all your folders here so let me uh, create a new folder here so you can click on your email address and create click on folder and give a new folder name that is your uh, let me write new batch new batch and let me write it one so this will create a new folder you can see here new folder in batch one now you can create a new notebooks on this so we will create a new notebook so you can create a new notebook from here also or from the uh, at the home page from here also okay but let me create on a specific location that is in a folder one new batch and here let me create a notebook so once you are creating a notebook you get a new window here and it will ask you for the name so let me write it as my first notebook and it will ask you to choose the language so by default it is choosing a uh, python but you can click on a drop down and you can find or you can choose whatever language you want so let me click on python and it is asking me to create a cluster so actually there is no cluster running now so let me click on create i got my first notebook and i am in my notebook now so you will be surprised to see that hey this looks similar to my jupyter notebook yeah so this is what exactly your databricks is you can say that it is looking like your jupyter notebook only or any of your python ide so here you have a cells but to run your cell you need to start the cluster you can see cluster is terminated so let me first create a cluster so if you go so we have explored what is workspace recent are nothing but if you want to just have a quick uh, access to your recent notebooks you can go here search you can search your workspace with your name the search bar so we'll talk about this data then first let me talk about this compute so I want to open that in a new tab. So I have clicked on right click and open link in a new tab. So I'll get a new tab open for compute. So compute. There are two types of compute in Databricks that comes with the all purpose cluster and or all purpose compute and second is a job compute. We will discuss about this job compute later on. So if you want to schedule a job, if you want to trigger this notebook, we can use this job cluster we will do that later on now let me create an all-purpose cluster and click on create compute now this is what your cluster ui looks like so we have discussed about what is 
cluster how to create a cluster like what do you mean by architecture how the driver node works how the worker node works and so on so this is your ui on cluster it is so simple you can set up a cluster in few minutes so in community edition when you are talking about community edition there are so less features or less options to create a cluster they they are asking only a name so what is a cluster name so let me write it is my first cluster and it is asking me to choose a databricks runtime version so you can choose your runtime maybe it is a spark 3.2 version scala 1.2 and i'm taking a 10.4 lts lts stands for long term support long term support or you can take the latest version also that 11.3 you can take or you can pick any of that so let me keep it for 10.4 and you do not have any other options in community edition but when you come to azure databricks there we have lot of options you need to select the worker types you need to choose how many workers you want and the type of worker and you need to choose the termination time you need to you get an option like auto scale uh, enable or not and so many options are there we will see that when we set up an azure databricks cluster but now we do not have much options but when it is a community edition you can see here at the top in community edition we do not get any worker nodes because community edition comes with free there is no worker nodes assigned for us and we get only one driver and it has 15 gb of storage with us 15 gb of memory with only two cores this uh, they are providing only for the practice like 15 gb memory and two cores but if you want to change the driver type also you cannot do that in the community edition but you can you can do it in azure databricks where you can choose your own resources like memory and cores so we do not have much of the options in community edition we now just click on create the clusters and wait for one or two seconds to start and you can read here like this instance will be created like your cluster instance will be created with a free of 15 gb memory in a community edition and your cluster will automatically terminate after idle period of 2 hours so if you are not using your clusters for more than 2 hours it will automatically terminate so this is a uh, uh, details of that instance okay so let us wait for one or two second to start your cluster once your cluster is started we will attach this cluster to our notebook and start executing the notebook yeah you can see here your cluster is now up and running now your cluster is running now let us go to our first notebook and let me attach the cluster that is called as first cluster to this notebook now i'll just go through all the things here in notebook so here you can add a new notebook you can clone it you can rename you can move this notebook delete this notebook and so on this is related to the cells like you can like uh, cut the current cell you can copy the current cell you can move the current cell up and down and so on okay we will see some features later on now we have a default language as python now let me write a python code so i'll say print a simple python code a python or a python okay let me run this so to run this you can either use shift enter or you can use control enter or you can click on this play button like run cell okay shift enter i'll use shift enter so if you use shift enter your cursor will be in the new line so now you can see that hey i have used python very simple now if you ask me can i run a scala on this notebook because i have chosen python as my default can i use scala here yeah obviously you can use by using a magic command in this cell so just concentrate on this here we have python 
but if I use a magic command like this, like percent Scala and your cell is converted to Scala, you can see beautifully like one code simply you can convert this whole cell to Scala. Now you can write in Scala print ln and this is not possible in any other IDE a Scala or a hey, run Scala. I can say hey run Scala. Okay shift enter to execute that so once it is executed you can see what is uh, like how much second it took to execute and who has executed that and at what time it has executed and on which cluster it has executed you can see that so it took 12 seconds and this took 0.10 seconds to execute because the default notebook is python and we are using a scala here so if you ask me like can I use SQL, obviously you can use SQL. Once I write a person SQL, your cell is now changed to SQL. Now you can see that you can use simple SQL statement like select, select, hey, run SQL. Let me run this and check. Yeah, you can see. The command is executed and you get the output like hey run sql so this is how a simple notebook of databricks look like and you can run different languages in one notebook you can use scala you can use sql you can use either r also to run this so this is how you can create a notebook so let me go with the next point we have seen compute now let me look at the data view. So once I click on this data view, I'll be seeing the databases and tables. And here I got a DBFS, but but when you uh, open at the very first time, you may not see this DBFS. So you need to enable this Databricks uh, file system UI. So we will talk more about what is DBFS. To enable this or you need to enable or disable so by default it is disabled so I'll show you how you need to do the settings so go to settings here you go to admin consoles in workspace setting you have some advanced settings here in advanced settings you just need to disable this so once you have disabled you need to refresh refresh this cluster or refresh this UI page so okay let me check now you can see your dbfs is not visible here so if you want to enable it again by default it is disabled you can go to settings you can go to admin console workspace setting and scroll a little bit down in advanced then you just click on click on the dbfs file browser i hope uh, then hit refresh to get your dbfs now the question comes what do you mean by dbfs what do you mean by dbfs so we will talk about that dbfs in a minute so dbfs is nothing but dbfs stands for databricks file system so this is the virtual storage that comes with your databricks so you can call this as a virtual storage you can access dbfs from here also or you can access dbfs from this option like once you click on create table you get dbfs option here so once you click on data and once you click on create table you will get this ui here you can upload your raw files by using this upload file you can connect to s3 so why we are getting s3 here is because this community edition comes with the uh, like amazon's s3 um, AWS is providing this community edition, so that's why they have S3 here. But once we log into Azure Databricks, we may not see this S3 and other sources. We may see only upload and DBFS. Okay, so DBFS is nothing but it is a Databricks file system. Uh, it is a storage layer, or you can call it as a virtual storage that Databricks is providing us. Okay, and you can connect to other data sources like. You have connectors like Amazon, Kinesis, Cassandra, Snowflake, JDBC, Kafka, Redis, MongoDB and so on. You can connect to various sources by using this. 
so here you have an option called create table so what is what do you mean by create table we will see that so in all the pages you have create table so how to upload a file and how to work with this notebook i'll tell you about that okay uh, then let me go to workflow so actually workflows are not enabled in your community edition you cannot use any workflows in community edition so for that we need to go to databricks upgraded version maybe with the azure or aws then you have an help settings and your personal email address details and you have an option menu option like you can expand it this will be there or if you want to use it and auto like once you hover your cursor it will open it okay you can use that so these are like uh, this is all about your databricks community edition so let me explain like uh, how your databricks workflow will be so for few sessions we will manually load data into dbfs we will manually load data in this dbfs or we upload it let me say upload once your files are in your dbfs we fetch that into our notebook databricks notebook and we create a table so this upload what we are uploading we are uploading a raw data so it can be your json file it can be your csv file it can be your xml file anything okay but in real time no client is uploading their data into dbfs who is going to upload their data into dbfs no one is going to apply but for practice we are uploading the data into a dbfs and then we are practicing but in real time your data will be in your blob storage it can be in your adls azure data lake storage or it is in your amazon s3 or it is in your google cloud or it can be or any event app or anything like that okay so this can be your real time data that is coming from different sources so we need to fetch the data or we need to mount this blob storage to your databricks so for practice we are fetching a data from dbfs or we are uploading it manually but in real time this would not be the case so we will mount this using a databricks and we fetch the data from notebook and we will convert the table but that table can be not in the dbfs again dbfs again it will be outside the dbfs definitely it should be your sql server or it will should be your sql database and so on so this is a high level understanding or you can call an end to end uh, pipeline we are creating so your data is coming from the sources and we are mounting that into our uh, dbfs using a mount point and we create few of the notebooks we write a code we do transform the data we clean the data we shape according to our one and your raw data will be converted to a table here and we push that table outside the databricks it may be your sql server it may be your azure sql database or it may be your adls depending upon the client's requirement we push the data there and we uh, do this as an end to end pipeline so what is special about the spark again so this can be done in any of the tool now anyone says that hey this can be done with hadoop also what is so special about spark yeah it can be done but what special about this is you can do batch you can do this real time also so without any human intervention your file comes in the source within fraction of seconds without any code or without running the code without going back to the notebook you can see your files in adls directly converted in a clean shot so that can be done in the real time so this is how your end to end pipeline looks once we uh, build the end to end pipeline in databricks i hope this theoretical part is very clear with you